Good evening. On behalf of the Dubuque League of Women Voters, I would like to welcome the television audience to this school board candidate forum. I am Sister Dolores Ulrich, a member of the League. The League is a nonpartisan political organization which encourages citizen participation in government. Membership is open to any citizen 18 years of age or older. We would like to thank our candidates for their participation this evening and for their invaluable gift to us by being candidates for public office. The four candidates for three seats of the Dubuque Community School District School Board in reverse alphabetical order are <laughs> Tara Siegert, Jim Prokoska, George Davis, and Craig Bytine. Each candidate may have one and a half minutes for an opening statement. For questions, they will have one and a half minutes to answer, and will be reminded of the time remaining with warning cards and finally by the bell. They will have two minutes for closing statements at the end of the forum. And now, Ms. Siegert, we will begin with you. Why are you a candidate for the Dubuque School Board? Um, I've decided to run for the school board because I think that the board needs a diverse representation um, to represent the entire district. Now this includes families, especially working families, um, the staff and um, the students as well and the teachers involved in the district. Um, I am a 1996 graduate of Dubuque Senior. I also have um, a Bachelor of Arts degree in English and Biology. I also um, have a Master's of Biology degree in Molecular Biology and, um, and I've traveled the world and I've seen things and I just want to be more involved in the district of where I came from. Thank you. Thank you. Greetings. Thank you, first of all, to the League of Women Voters for hosting this forum. My name is Jim Prohaska, and I am running for school board uh, because I really want to give something back to the community, back to our youth. Uh, I feel a need to do this for uh, several reasons. Uh, I am basically, I've been an employee of the Dubuque Community School District for 40 years. I love my job. I've been a Dubuque resident for 50 years. I'm a Loris graduate, and presently I'm an adjunct professor at the University of Dubuque. Uh, the present board has a great makeup. I like the strategic plan that they have, and I would like to work with them uh, closely in implementing the strategic plan. And I look forward to serving on the board. Thank you. Mr. Davis. Again, thank you uh, to the League of Women Voters for hosting us this evening. I know it's a lot of work, and like the school board, I don't think you folks are, I think you pay, folks are paid about as much as the school board is paid, so I'd <laughs> like to thank all you for your service. Uh, my name's George Davis. I've lived in Dubuque uh, for 20 years. My wife is Chris Even. Uh, we both uh, work here in the community. Uh, we have two children, an 18-year-old daughter who's just starting college, uh, who went to, just graduated from Dubuque Senior High School, and a 16-year-old daughter at uh, Dubuque Senior High School. So we were a Bryant, Washington, senior high family. Um, I g got involved in the school board seven years ago because I wanted for our community's children the same thing I want for my children, to help develop educated persons of character, to help children and our young people to learn how to solve problems, to possess confidence, to learn how to work hard and to value relationships, which I think are key skills in uh, going forward and enabling them to live a disciplined, happy, and productive life when they leave our school system um, to help make our community one of the greatest communities in the Midwest and the greatest communities in the country to live in. Um, I'm proud of my work on the school board with fiscal issues and I believe I'm one of the most knowledgeable people around on fiscal issues and school board issues and, and um, those are some of the reasons why I'm running for uh, to be school board. 
and Mr. Brian King. Thank you, Sister Dolores, and uh, thank you for uh, coming this evening and attending this event. Um, I was elected to the board four years ago. Um, one of the major motivators for me um, uh, going towards the board or deciding to run for the board uh, was my own children and my experience with them. Uh, I have three children with special needs, and uh, they're particular of interest to me to see that they are receive the the attention and the services that they are uh, that they deserve. Um, I'm pleased to say one of the main reasons we moved to Dubuque is because they deliver those kinds of services here. And I definitely wanted to see that uh, continue. Um, I also am a firm believer that the investments we make right now with our kids are going to pay off in the future. And if we look at the, uh, the workforce needs of not only our community but of, the, of, of our nation, uh, we have to do a better job of preparing our kids for their futures. And so one of the things I'm very, very interested in is ensuring that um, our kids have multiple pathways uh, in which to achieve their diploma and uh, be able to go forth and go into areas that perhaps not all of them are prepared for college. Some of them will go into the trade, some of them going into other fields. And uh, it's really important that they have a well-rounded, um, uh, academically rigorous and positive experience uh, here in the district and that's what I'm dedicated to do. Thank you. The next question, what qualifi qualifications or skills life experiences would you bring to the position? And we'll begin with you, Mr. Prokaska. As I, uh, thank you. As I previously stated, uh, I am a veteran teacher. I think I have a very good knowledge of the school district. Uh, I feel like I was a very successful educator. And uh, I wish to bring that component to the school board. Um, my experience has been in secondary education, uh, although my wife uh, was a lifelong elementary uh, teacher. I also uh, have been involved in um, the Long Range Planning and Advisory Commission for the City of Dubuque. And there we did some of the analysis of some of the projects for the city. The city has been doing some great things. The city seems to be moving forward very well and I look forward to the school district uh, doing likewise. I also, and I also am involved a little bit in the budgeting process there and also uh, at my church, St. Rayfield's Cathedral. I've been involved in the buildings and grounds program, uh, so I'm familiar with budgets, etc. And overall, I would say I'm pretty conservative in my financial uh, views. So I, uh, I would like to bring that to the, to the uh, school board. I also uh, would like to bring the, some of my uh, ideas about uh, student achievement and in particular character development. Uh, these are some areas that we need to continually work on with students. Thank you. And Mr. Davis. I grew up in a family of teachers. My mother was a teacher. My aunts were teachers. My grandmother was a principal. And so I was under the tutelage of many teachers in my, in my youth. I've got a parent of two children who use as many of the services of the Dubuque Community School District as anybody. We've been through just about every program there is at the school district. My main qualifications, I would say, are I've got 4,000 probably hours of experience working with the school district over the last seven years uh, through um, many difficult issues. I'm an attorney that deals with finance issues and complex real estate transactions is, is what I do for work. I'm on the board of directors and was a founder of Western Dubuque Biodiesel, which is a 30 million gallon biodiesel plant in Farley with a budget of about $100 million annually. And uh, we raised about $30 million to start the plant uh, five or six years ago. And so I've got experience dealing with large financial transactions. I believe I'm one of, barring the uh, school financial officers, I think my knowledge of school finance is as good as uh, anybody on any school board in the state of Iowa and it's really the finances where we have school district st solid finances that enables all the other good things when the finances are in trouble everything else is under pressure everybody in the district is under pressure and I think that's probably the biggest um, thing that I'm able to help provide this the school board in the school district thank you Mr. Biden. thank you um, uh, I have a 
fairly extensive background in uh, education publishing, 30 years as an educational publisher. So I'm used to working with teachers and, and administrators and helping to devise and create products that meet students' needs. Um, I have uh, obviously some very personal experience with special needs issues, uh, uh, particularly IEPs and how they work and, and, and how they're to benefit students. Um, I've uh, been on several other boards within our community. I've served on the Humane Society Board. Um, I've served uh, as president, currently the president of Dubuque Rotary. Um, and uh, very recently I was appointed to uh, the board of directors for AEA. Uh, because I have a passion to understand how that operation works. So um, most of my both professional and, uh, and uh, personal life has been wrapped up in either education related activities. Uh, um, I've managed up to a $40 million revision program and for publishing. So from a financial standpoint, I certainly have that background. Um, and I'm an elder in our, our local church congregation. So um, yeah, I, I, I'm busy, but uh, it's a good busy and I enjoy it tremendously. Thank you, and Ms. Sigurd. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, although I don't have any direct experience as in the uh, district as a teacher or an administrator, um, I think I have the valuable perspective as a working mother with small children. I have a stepdaughter that's going to uh, Roosevelt this year in sixth grade, and I have two small daughters that haven't even entered the district yet. They're three and two. Um, I think with that, coming from a working class household, um, both of us work, both of us parents, and then I think that gives me a great perspective where I can relate to the teachers, the staff, the families, um, as well as the students who come from the same kind of household that I do. Um, I think that helps keep an open communication with the teachers and staff so they can let us know exactly what is needed in the district. Thank you. Thank you. The next question. Do you favor renovating old school buildings instead of building new schools? How important is it to keep neighborhood schools? And we'll begin with Mr. Davis. As far as renovating old, building new, uh, that's pretty much gonna be a case by case. I, I think the best answer for that is that's a case by case uh, decision. Um, most of our buildings that we have in the Dubuque School District the older they are, the better constructed they are. And uh, we find that with our WPA elementary schools that were built in the 1930, Marshall, Fulton, Lincoln, Bryant. We find that with our two middle school buildings, uh, Washington and Jefferson, that were built in 1921, 1922, and we find that with Dubuque Senior High School. Um, I think, certainly think all of those buildings are very high quality buildings that renovations would, would make uh, more sense than uh, than building new. We have other buildings that we may have to consider building new on. As far as neighborhood schools, you know, we went through that three or four years ago. The former uh, superintendent and, uh, the, had a recommendation that uh, had a lot of X's in a lot of uh, neighborhood schools and, uh, you know, of all the things I did on the school board during my time, I think I was, it was one to six and a lot of those votes or a lot of those discussions along the way on those neighborhood schools and I'm glad we slowed that down to allow our more time for people to think about what they want and I certainly support neighborhood schools. I, my children went to Bryant. Um, it was a great neighborhood school. It's a place where everybody could walk and I certainly support the neighborhood schools as well. Thank you. Mr. Bytean. Um, I certainly agree with George that uh, renovation or, or new schools really comes down to a case-by-case -case basis. Um, what we have to realize is that the learning models are changing and the, you know, the standard kind of stand and deliver model uh, for, for a large percentage of our kids just isn't as effective anymore. So creating environments where kids can interact with technology, uh, can work with peers in a collaborative environment requires us to rethink what is today's classroom. So that's really the driving. It's not that the building should drive the program, it's that the program should drive what the building needs are. And I think that's something our board has been fairly dedicated in doing and ensuring that. Relative to neighborhood schools, um, you know, there was a, quite a, a, a debate, if you will, about what that really meant. And when we actually got data back from the public, um, for many people, a neighborhood school is the school my children go to. Um, and, and yet, we recognize as a board that uh, nobody wants to be taken from their neighborhood into another school. So 
I think the, ultimately the board made the right decisions not to consider any type of closures or combining of schools. We believe, I think, that the maximum number of sections for any one school should not exceed three. And so those are kind of guiding principles that have really determined our decisions as a board for the last two or three years. And Ms. Seeger, thank you. Um, I think on the decision whether or not to renovate or build new, I agree with both gentlemen that it's going to be on a case-by-case -case basis. But I think another thing that's going to have to take into um, consideration is, is whether or not the Dubuque Community School District will ever look at year-round schooling. And if that's the case, obviously we're going to want some air conditioning um, in some of the older schools. Um, I think whatever decision is made, it's, it's got to be based on what's best for our kids. Um, what they need in the school. So if it's a technology-based learning that we're driving towards, then obviously we're going to have to upgrade some things so that there's um, better technology for us, to, for our kids to prepare themselves for the working world. Um, I am definitely for neighborhood schools. I think that they have a valuable sense of community that um, our school system is based upon, and I think it's great that we should keep them intact. Thank you. I concur with the rest of the candidates regarding uh, renovating uh, schools. Uh, there are some older schools that the possibility of air conditioning, things of this nature, will be rather expensive. But that will be, have to be something. That there might be new technology that comes around and may be able to solve some of the problems more easily. Uh, I, I do favor the concept of neighborhood schools. I think the community spoke very loudly several years ago in the sale of the PAC property was uh, implied and uh, the community indicated that, that they did not want the big box, big box concept as far as schools go. They want neighborhood schools. We do want more community engagement, engagement with the parents and uh, something like neighborhood schools obviously is the type, is the way to go. Um, so I uh, favor neighborhood schools highly. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, as the world shrinks through travel, world trade, do you think it is important to speak English? When and how would you include a second language in the curriculum? And Mr. Vitine will begin. Um, well, I know we have some language programs in the district. Um, clearly, we, uh, given the population shift in the United States, uh, the, probably the most natural second language would be Spanish. Um, I uh, myself took advantage of language programs in school, and I actually learned to speak English better as a result, at least, well, some people think so. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I, I think it's also a cultural thing. It's also exposing us to cultures in a way that perhaps we may not otherwise. You know, I think Dubuque is becoming more and more diverse every day, but our history is not one of diversity. And so I think that uh, opportunities to expose kids to different languages, different cultures, uh, different uh, perspectives is very important. And uh, I know that we have good programs in the district. I know that we have programs in uh, advanced placement within the language spectrum. Um, the more of those the better. It's the cheapest college credit you can possibly get is AP. Um, so generally speaking, I'm very positive and in, in, in favor of, of language programs. Um, you know, English is our mother tongue. Uh, it's what we should all speak. It's the international language of business. Uh, I don't see that being uh, set aside in favor of any other language, but I think exposure to other languages and other cultures can only benefit uh, the perspectives of our kids. Thank you. Um, I believe that the opportunities that the district have with um, learning second languages is great. Obviously, it could be expanded upon greatly, but at the high school level, I think having the three major languages are a huge ordeal. I think it's important, though, to continue uh, teaching kids, as Craig said, the, um, the culture and the initiative to be open about other cultures along with the language is very important so that maybe they'll pursue that if they go on to college or in, excuse me, in their business career. I likewise agree that uh, having a second language is uh, a tool that probably everyone should have. Um, I recall in my days at senior high school, the uh, language arts teachers uh, not only had uh, multiple years of the foreign language, 
but they also had cultural activities that were designed around the particular language that they were teaching. And this enhanced the uh, teaching of their uh, subject and the students had a, a, a gained a lot from this experience. So I don't think we, you know, we want to keep, the, we, we need to keep the foreign languages. Uh, obviously though, we have to think about our language being number one and uh, possibly take care of that uh, as well or more so. So thank you. Mr. Davis. I believe foreign languages are important. Um, I think when you look at the hierarchy of educational activities, I, th I think they would probably be in a second tier of those. Uh, the first tier consisting of math and science, English, social studies. Uh, s probably in our district, in our community, the languages would fall in a group of a whole host of other things that would be below those core subjects. Uh, most of our children in the Dubuque Community School District take at least three years worth of a foreign language right now. Uh, my daughter was able to take French when she was at senior high. I've got another daughter taking Spanish who's there right now. Um, uh, my daughter that's in college, all of, the, uh, all of the students in her college are required to take foreign language and they combine those foreign languages with, a, with the social studies world history component that they are of the, of the language that they're going to take. So if they're taking a Chinese language, they study Asian uh, history and culture. If they're taking a um, French, they would study European history, um, which that I was th thought that was an interesting concept as far as how to uh, kind of improve the experience of the language. So, um, so yes, I think it's important. I think it falls below, below the core group of uh, subjects. The next question, is there a good way to make sure our children are safe in their classrooms? And we'll begin with you, Ms. Seeger. Thank you. Um, I don't think there's any way for us to prepare for anything that we've heard in the news with schools lately, um, bad things that happen, including the shootings and such. Um, I think the best way we can do is just to make sure that our teachers and our staff are um, trained and prepare, prepared um, for something like that that may happen, um, including the principals. I think maybe just some development of training programs that would help in that area would be a good idea. Well, I would say uh, basically when parents uh, have their students in school for seven hours or so per day, they expect not only in transportation, but while they're at school to be safe, to be in a safe, uh, uh, nurturing environment. And uh, I, I do know now the schools do have emergency plans that are uh, in place uh, ever since the recent tragedies. And you never know, you always have to be prepared for kind of the worst possible scenario. So. Uh, Obviously, I am in favor of uh, making any plans that, that involve safety of our students. Mr. Davis. All of us want our children to be safe. And you know, you try to measure that with all of the time we could spend all day long, every day for 182 days just talking about safety and making plans for safety and not have any classroom education going on. And, to, if you take it to the furthest extreme, um, you, we try to make our buildings safe, but then you know our kids, all kids go out for recess, and how you know the building's locked, but kids, every elementary school has all their kids lining up outside before school. Every bus that's on the road, there's nothing we can do to make schools 100% safe from violence from outside. But I think we're doing the best we can, and I think we're taking reasonable approaches. When this subject comes up, I always like to talk about what I think is the biggest safety concern for our kids, and that's pedestrian vehicle accidents. Uh, since the time I've been on the board, we've had two fatalities in and around the school district with an employee and a, and a student. We have numbers of accidents every year with those types of things, and I, and I think we could do more in the district to really be vigilant, as vigilant as we are on some of the other safety issues from outsiders with looking at the safety procedures for pickup drop off, for parking lots, for kids getting to and from school. And you look at what Clark College does with some of their 
walkways for students. We could do a lot more things like that to help make our areas around our schools safer for uh, pedestrians. I, th I think my peers certainly have highlighted a number of things. Um, you know, one of our core attributes of our mission is that uh, our, our kids will be in a safe and, and inclusive learning environment. I remember having our discussion about our mission and how we thought about that safety issue and how important it was. It's one thing to say it, though. It's another thing to do it. And I do know that there are plans in every building for any kind of you know, anticipated conflict, whether that be you know, Mother Nature or, uh, or Mother Angry. Uh, and it's important that we uh, have a, a, a program that um, allows our students to feel safe and yet not cross that line of instilling fear in our kids. I think there's, a, there's a, a line that can be crossed if we, I was noting that one of the, I think it was the Iowa City Schools perhaps, maybe it was Des Moines, that were running through scenarios where they had uh, policemen with uh, firearms running through the building. And, uh, and I, was, I thought through that, I said, would we do that, something like that here? And to me, that just instills fear and, and, and apprehension. Uh, you know, there, other things can be um, uh, accomplished through training, preparation. Uh, a lot of our uh, building renovations have been wrapped around line of sight issues from the office to the door so that we can prevent someone who perhaps otherwise would want to get in from getting in. So I think that we're addressing it adequately uh, for the most part. Can we do more? We can always do more. I just don't want to cross that line into instilling fear into our kids. That would be the wrong choice, I think. Thank you. Our next question. Should there be an expansion in the voucher system? And we'll begin with Mr. Prokasko. Well, right now I know there's a uh, system in the state of Iowa, there's, I believe there's a uh, reimbursement of uh, voucher, 25%, I believe, of tuition up to $250. And I personally think that the uh, voucher system may be needed in some schools and some school districts. But I don't think uh, you can make a blanket statement that all schools, for example, in the state of Iowa should be uh, implement a certain percentage voucher system, et cetera. So overall, I am not in favor of, of expanding the voucher system. I think in some respects uh, it a little bit uh, subverts the public educational system, especially when you have a good public education system like we have here in Dubuque. Um, however, the need, the, the parochial schools or the private schools, they have a place in our society. And uh, they are highly valued, uh, as are our public school system. And our, our school system here in Dubuque has a very, very good reputation, not only in, within the school district, but from the uh, private segment uh, as well. So uh, I'm kind of hoping that the conditions stay the same as they are. Thank you. Mr. Davis. Thank you. Um, the, what Jim was talking about, Iowa has a credit, um, just for a new, to help clarify, I have as a credit of 25% um, of the first $1,000 for students that attend parochial school, private schools. They can be religious or non-religious based to help cover the tuition. And really isn't, the $250 isn't going to incent somebody to send their is a loan going to incent somebody to go to private school, but it is a way to help make that more palatable for those people that pay private tuition. Um, the, the Iowa has open district enrollment, so if a student from Western Dubuque wanted to come to Dubuque, we can let them, or for any other district. So in a sense, they can come here if they want. Um, as far as the Dubuque schools, we generally are pretty flexible if there are needs for people that they need to be in a different school than their home school. We've generally have been fairly flexible, but I believe all of our schools in the Dubuque Community School District have great people that work there, provide great instruction, and there's not one school I wouldn't send my child to in the Dubuque Community School District. So on a, strictly on a local level, I really don't see the need for how vouchers would make anything different locally. On a national basis, I guess that's another issue, and, but for Dubuque, uh, I think we're good the way we are, and I don't, there's not, having vouchers is not going to help us. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Bikey. 
I have to agree with George. With our open enrollment policy, with uh, the flexibility, with the relationship we have with the parochial schools here in Dubuque, I don't see any reason to make any uh, changes. I actually think that's a decision that local school boards should be empowered uh, to make and to set that kind of policy. Um, if other uh, environments are such that uh, that board and that community feels a need for it, that should be up to them individually. But for Dubuque, I don't see any value in, in uh, uh, changing the way the, the, the status quo is currently. Thank you. Ms. Secret, thank you. Um, I, for one, am against the voucher program expansion. I think um, I th I'm a strong supporter of public education, and I think uh, providing vouchers takes away from public education. Um, I think we should be putting money towards public education so we continuously be improving it in our uh, public schools in the district, wherever they may be. And our next question, what do you think is the school district's best asset? And we'll begin with Mr. Davis. Best asset. Well, I, th I think our people that we have in the district are our best asset. We have great kids, we have great teachers, we have great employees, we have great administrators. Um, so I, I think uh, through all those, I think you'd be hard pressed to find a school district um, in the Midwest that has any better people working for it than the Dubuque Community School District. Uh, I'm very happy. We, we Stan Ryan Gentz, our current superintendent, is the third superintendent that I've been associated since I've been on the school board. And um, he's brought a calmness to the district that is very appreciated by not only the school board, but by the employees and the staff. Um, I think a testament to that calmness is our school board meetings, which weren't lo terribly long to begin with, but have really shortened up because there just aren't any, uh, everybody's happy with the way with the way things are operating. Um, we have tremendous teachers, we have tremendous kids and families in our district. So uh, one of our goals for the school district was, or what we think is we can be the best small district school district in the country and I think that this people are what makes our district that great school district. Mr. Viking. Well, George said it, it's the staff. Um, one of the things that I've been impressed with continually is, and we have opportunities to go into the building and participate in various programs and, and go to assemblies and things of that nature and you know, get a chance to talk to parents and stakeholders in the community. And the one thing they repeatedly say is that we got the best teachers, we have the best staff. Um, that doesn't happen by accident. That's not just something that just occurs. Uh, it's a combination of really good recruiting it's a combination of an environment where teachers feel like they can uh, express themselves and, uh, and uh, bring something of their own personality to what they do. Uh, it's also a reflection of the professional development that uh, the board and others have to support in order for teachers to get the training they need to be successful. Um, I, I think we have a model relationship with the Dubuque Education Association. Um, I haven't been in any other districts as a board member but I've been to uh, regional and national meetings and I, there's sometimes there's a great deal of enmity between those parties. We just cooperate. We believe in the same things. We have same core values and I think that's reflective of, of the nature of our city, the way our city works with different institutions, the way we collaborate with one another and uh, I, that it really comes down to our people. It's, it's our teachers, it's our staffs, it's our administrators. Thank you. Um, I agree with uh, George and Craig most definitely. I'm, our teachers, our administration, the superintendent, um, great assets to our community. Um, I don't know how many times I've heard from teachers that this is the best district that they could ever work for. It's just a great place to be. So I think there's a reason for that. There's a great sense of community within um, the staff and the teachers and, and it's a great place to be a part of. Thanks. Don't, I don't need me to sound like a broken record, but I agree with everyone. Um, the best asset, that I, I, of course, is our employees, our teachers, our administrators, our superintendent, 
I as a I am a prime example of that. Uh, <laughs> our former teachers. I, our former teachers. Some are in the audience. Um, but I spent uh, 40 years in Dubuque Community School District, and I was very proud to be a teacher uh, in the Dubuque schools. Um, I felt like uh, we were well accepted in the community, and uh, overall, the uh, job satisfaction that I had, obviously, if I stayed there here that long, I must have liked something. <laughs> and uh, my, both my wife and I raised our children here in the Dubuque Community School District. Many of my friends raised their children in the Dubuque Community School District. And overall, uh, I have nothing but good feelings towards the uh, Dubuque Community School District. So uh, I attribute that to the teachers, the administrators, and everybody that has a part of their lives, because it is all about the students. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, do you think teachers and administrators should be paid according to test scores? Mr. Vitine. Uh, that's a great question. Um, I've been asked that on more than a few occasions. Um, when it comes to evaluating teachers, which I think is the core of what you're asking, um, any rubric or any measurement of performance cannot be a single thing. Um, if there were to be an agreed upon uh, procedure whereby um, all the parties, all the stakeholders, and I would include even parents in this, as, a, as state major stakeholders here, to sit down and decide what is the best way. It's not just one or two observations during a term. Uh, it's not just the grades in the classroom. You may have a population of kids that um, are simply struggling more than others. Uh, I think looking at cohort data, looking at uh, cumulative data of an individual student over time is a better indicator of their performance. Um, and then there's the intangibles. Um, you know, believe it or not, looking at me, you probably wouldn't believe that I was a, a BC student. Um, but and yet, we can be successful in life without necessarily being the the straight A student. There are other things within this environment, this learning environment, that bring uh, value to our lives and make us better people. Uh, the activities programs that we have in the district are you know, very important. I played football for, you know, three years through my school years, or five years actually, in total. And that experience taught me how to work with people and be on teams and so on and so forth. So there are a lot that goes into determining whether a child's going to ultimately be successful. And I think those factors have to be part of that mix. But it has to be agreed upon by everyone. Everyone has to have a place at the table in determining how things are evaluated. And Ms. Seager. Um, I am definitely against teachers being evaluated based on students' performance. Um, I don't think a teacher's ability to teach should be based on each individual student's performance. Um, all kids learn at different levels and they all have different abilities. And I think that we should put more emphasis on having teachers, um, uh, keeping in mind that that is actually true. Like, kids need. Um, different ways to learn. Some kids um, ex excel better at math. Some kids excel better at reading. Other kids love to play music or be an artist. And I think that we should um, encourage kids to find their path instead of trying to get them to have a certain test score. Thank you. Mr. Procasco. I likewise do not really think that uh, teachers' pay should be based upon their evaluation. Just as in this fact that students are different, one student to another, schools are different, one school to another. Classes are different, one class to another. And so it's very difficult in my mind to uh, just put data on something and just, put, just based upon test scores. Uh, I think it's, a, it's just trying to quantify our, our uh, educational system a little bit too much. We do need some data. But I don't think that, it, that the uh, wages should be based upon data, should not be uh, data driven. We have in this school district some of the most dedicated teachers, dedicated coaches. They spend time <coughs> way beyond the normal classroom day. And uh, they have that in their heart that they want to do this. And 
I, I think that uh, we, we have to rely upon that dedication because that's why teachers, administrators, etc., are in the profession to begin with <coughs> because they care about kids. They care about students. They want their students to do as best as they can, whether it be in sports, classroom, etc. Thank you. Mr. Davis. Thank you. Craig, I believe you're a BC student. <laughs> I believe that. <laughs> um, there's a lot more that goes in to what we're trying to get at than student achievement. Um, uh, we are in the student achievement business, but it's not to student achievement, it's just not test scores. And I, I had a conversation with one of the partners at Han Camp Career once, and he said, you know, we get a lot of students that apply, they're straight A students, they never got to be in their life. And if they haven't done something to show us that they can do more than just the studies, if they haven't been on an athletic team or the band or uh, been out and uh, done a drama performance, we find that those kids, once they get into the work environment, the first failure, they tend to, they tend to really have difficulties. So uh, translating that to our educational environment, I think, there's a, I think the test scores are important. I think the test scores show us a lot, but I think there's a lot more to it than that. Uh, we don't currently have a system in Iowa that uh, ties teacher pay to raw data scores on tests. Uh, those tests are influenced by the makeup of the demographic makeup of often of the students that uh, are in the in the different schools and and um, I think there's a big part of where our evaluation process has to be driven is through uh, the relationship with the principal and the other teachers in the building and uh, the other teachers know who the great teachers are and who needs help. Our next question, to what degree of importance do you place on the relationship between the Iowa State Legislature and the school board? Ms. Siegert? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think it's very important for uh, the school board to have open communication with local government as well as the state legislature. I mean, a lot of the things that are directed in our district is regulated by the state legislator. So I think that it's very important for us to keep open communication and make sure that our, our ideas are well heard to our representatives that do represent us um, at the state level. Thank you. Obviously, it's very important that we maintain a good relationship with our state representatives. Um, case in point, uh, the extension of the 1% uh, sales option tax uh, till 2028. Um, we, as a board, you know, need to continually be kept informed about the uh, state procedures as far as anything that goes to the Department of Public Instruction basically goes from the legislature, the way I understand it, legislature to the Department of Public Instruction and then to uh, the various school districts. So we obviously need to keep in tune with our legislatures and uh, they, are, they ultimately are in charge of distributing the funds for the school districts. So uh, we've got we've to keep them on our side, so to speak. Thanks. Thank Mr. Davis. Oh, could you repeat the question, Sister Dolores? To what degree of importance do you place on the relationship between the Iowa State Legislature and the school board? Well, it is an important relation. It's a very important relationship. And I guess where I sit from my experience on the school board is I believe, I believe our kids would be better served if the decisions are made as close to the kids as possible. And I guess I say that in that when the Iowa legislature makes, or the federal government make decisions to tell the kids what, they have, what they're gonna eat today, I, don't, I think it's better to have those decisions as close to the kids as possible. And I, so some things we just have gotten a little how to hand with how far away simple decisions are made. Even, it shouldn't be the school board, I mean, down to the superintendent, down to the staff. I mean, the closer we can get real decisions made to the kids, the better results we're gonna have. And, from our perspective on the school board, it's very frustrating when legislature, federal government comes in and has 100 rules on this is what you're serving today for lunch, this is what you're saving tomorrow. We're supposed to tell you how much money you're gonna have, but we're not gonna tell you because we can't decide and it's their fault and it's their fault. So 
I think we would have better results. I think our kids would be better served. I think our employees would be better served if decisions were made as close to the kids as possible. Um, local control, I agree with George, local control is, is critical for success, I believe, but um, you know, our board, I know, has you know, personal relationships with everyone from you know, Pat Murphy to you know, Pam Yoakum to Todd Bowman to Tom Hancock. I mean, we, we, we spend time with these people. We communicate with them. We go down to Des Moines on more than a few occasions. Um, it's important for us to keep a pulse on what they're thinking. And as important as it is to write a letter uh, and make formal uh, declarations from our board table. I'll tell you what, I'd trade every one of those for the hallway conversations that we have with Pam Yoakum at the State House or talking to, uh, uh, to Pat Murphy or to one of the legislators and let them know what the, the story is behind the issue. Because uh, if you can personalize it at that level, we have a much better chance of making them understand really the, impa the impact of decisions they make. We get way too many unfunded or under underfunded mandates. And it puts a burden on our, our district, it puts a burden on our state. And by, not, by keeping um, well connected with these people, we can see the horizon, we can see what's coming, and we can prepare better for those things. So important, critically important. And I think uh, this board has shown that they are willing to take the time to not only uh, establish those relationships, but maintain them. Thank you. The next question. Do you support a cooperative city aquatic center? Who would you involve in the planning? And Mr. Prokaska, we'll begin with you. Very good, I'm glad you asked that question because that was one of my uh, items that I'm highly interested in. Um, I definitely support a joint adventure with the city of Dubuque and the Dubuque schools for an uh, indoor aquatic center. Um, several cities that we that are relatively close to us have some type of joint venture and uh, part of the comprehensive plan of the city of Dubuque is to have a healthy uh, population and a lot of people now are using water uh, exercises water aerobics etc uh, I happen to be a member of the Y and uh, a lot of people there use the facility I have noticed uh, when I come there early in the morning, and the pool right now is not working, <laughs> approximately uh, there's only about a third of the cars there that are normally there. So I definitely support this project. Uh, it's something that we need to uh, work on. There is a committee presently, a feasibility study going on right now, and I happen to know a few members of the committee. and. Uh, it seems to be making some progress, but it may be uh, just in the planning phase. Location, things of this issue, things of this, these issues are a factor in this. But I am wholly in support of it. Mr. Davis. My daughter's a swimmer. She's been swimming since she was eight. I suppose I've got nine years of a swim parent. I've been to swimming pools all over the uh, Midwest. Um, I support what makes sense. And one of the things we talk about on the school board is that the ideas have to win. And it seems like a good idea for Dubuque. We have three pools that are all 40 years plus old. They are all at the end of the lifestyle. They are life cycle. They all have mechanical problems. We've got $2 million worth of costs in the Hempstead pool just to get it, the mechanicals fixed. Not a lot, of, not really any of the other aesthetics or other issues that that pool has, the safety issues that that pool has. Um, so I support what makes sense. I think a, a collaborative effort with a number of parties to have one quality facility seems like that would be a good idea. We're studying that. There's a group with the city and school district that are studying that. As far as the partners, it's the people that use aquatic services, the why, the colleges, in particular Loris that has a swim team, our hospitals that use it for rehabilitation, the parochial school system, Wallard has a women's swimming team, our community at large, the school district, the city, uh, are the main partners that we potentially could have. And I think it makes sense in concept, how it would work logistically, that has to make sense too, but the idea has to win and hopefully it will. I had the, uh, the pleasure and honor to be uh, at that very first meeting with Mike Van Milligan, the mayor, 
Um, Leader Services was there. Um, Otto Kruger and myself represented the board in that very first nascent meeting with the city to explore this idea of collaborating. Um, clearly, we decided that the costs associated with uh, with uh, maintaining or, or rebuilding Hempstead were simply prohibitive. And uh, uh, you know, we're a river city. We ought to have an aquatic center. So. Um, you know, initially it was pretty much the city and the district who were kind of determining whether to play together. Recently, uh, Sharon Covey, who's the director, the director of the YM and YWCA, has stepped forward and also indicated some interest. Um, look, it's the best thing ever if we can collaborate. But one thing that we've made very clear from the school district's perspective is that we we know what we need to, uh, for our kids, and if we can come together with the city in a way that's financially advantageous. Uh, that meets the needs of the larger population. Uh, frankly, I'd like to see free or low-cost swimming lessons for every kid in Dubuque. And having a facility like that might actually make that possible. We ought not to have any drownings anywhere in the city uh, if we have kids who are properly trained how to swim. So a facility like that would, I think, would be a major step in that direction. So am I supportive? Yeah, I've been supportive from the very beginning. I continue to be. I'm eager to see what the results of the feasibility study are. Obviously, costs play a role, but uh, yeah, bring it on. We want it. Um, <clears throat> for me, I'm not really either for or against the Aquatic Center. Um, I'm open to a cooperative with the city, but there's many aspects involved in that, um, as they brought up cost. I mean, if we're going to have a cooperative with the city, is it going to be feasible for families um, to be able to pay to use it? I guess there's a lot of things to take into perspective before a huge decision needs to be made, um, as well as the upkeep um, and who would be in charge of that. Um, I think it'd just be important to involve everyone that needs to be before a decision's made and look at all the possibilities, the ramifications of something like that if it were to be built. Thank you. The next question, as you look at the Dubuque public school system, what do you believe has been done very well, and where do you see improvements needed? And we begin with Mr. Davis. I don't think there's, a, in the seven years I've been on the board, and in the time before that, I don't think there's been a time when the district has been as at peace, at calmness as there is right now. It's a great time in the district. We have tremendous student achievement. And I think one of the tremendous, you know, we have great leadership at the forum, but one of the things, and we've talked about other strengths, but one of the things we haven't talked about is the financial strength of the district that makes everything possible. We've been through times when we didn't have the finances. When I went on the board, we had maybe a $6 million of, of cash. Now we have $35 million of cash, where our debt's down by $20 million and our property taxes are lower over the last two years by 15%. So our finances are extremely strong, which makes a lot of things easier in the district. So that's right now a tremendous strength in the district. As for things to, we can do better, I'm a big advocate in utilizing the volunteers in our community, both volunteers helping the school and our school helping other volunteer organizations. I'm a big believer in community partnerships and how we can tie all of the groups, the 100 plus groups in our community that provide educational services to kids, the Y, the uh, Arboretum, the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts, uh, our faith institutions that deliver educational services, all, how can we tie our leisure services for kids, how can we tie all of those, get our kids in their programs and help those groups to help us make our programs better. I think those are some things that we could do, uh, see some improvement on. Mr. Um, <clears throat> what we do very well, I think we have the right leadership. Uh, uh, with Stan Reingens and his team, um, we went through a fairly dramatic uh, change in leadership in this last year. Um, I think the board uh, made the right choices relative to uh, ushering in a different leadership and a different vision for the district. Um, George mentioned our financial security. Clearly, we are, have been in a position for the last two years in a row to lower our tax levy. Um, that's just unheard of. People don't lower things. Uh, we did, uh, twice, up to 15%. Um, we, we finally put together, I think, a strategic plan that is both measurable and accountable. 
and uh, uh, that's the most, the second most important thing a board can do, aside from hiring good leadership, is to give a to give direction in a way that uh, will mean uh, meaningful change and advancement. Um, you know, is there things we could do better? All the time, there's things we could do better. Um, I do think that although I, we're in many respects a model for community collaboration, there are other things we can be doing. George enumerated several of those. Um, I think the biggest focus now that we have a solid foundation is to um, work on student achievement. And it always pains me when the latest uh, No Child Left Behind data comes out and we're once again called a district in need of assistance or another school is designated as a school, it doesn't tell the whole story. We've had consistent uh, increases in student achievement uh, over the last 10 years. Uh, we continue to have it um, and I think we can continue to build on that and that's my hope. Thank you. And Ms. Seeker. Um, I think what we've been doing well is uh, We've been giving opportunities to students so they can achieve at the levels that they need to. Um, I think we're doing a really great, great job of retaining our teachers as well. Um, for improvement, I think there could be better communication with the school board to families or teachers on the goings on of what's, what decisions are being made. It's not really out there unless you really look for it. Um, I think also that professional development for teachers is a big thing. Um, they need the time in order for them to um, get the curriculum ready um, for their students so that the kids can learn at their own potential. Um, I think time is a big thing for teachers as well as for our paraprofessionals and the staff that help with the students as well. Thank you. I think uh, we've uh, done very well in our central administration and all our administrators in our school district which transcends down to our staff as we talked about staff and uh, teachers. I think our facilities are for the better part uh, very good. Uh, obviously as the gentleman mentioned, Craig mentioned about the uh, financial aspects, lowering of the taxes, tax levy, that's an obvious plus. Uh, so we have a lot of good things going in the, in the school district as we do in the city of Dubuque. Um, so several areas that I think we may be, need some improvement in is continually the student achievement is a work in progress. We have to continually work on it. And uh, I think this is one of the areas. And obviously I believe that getting parents involved is, is, a, is a key. Uh, if somehow we can get some of these parents involved, the, the first educator is the home. And so I think. Uh, that's, a, that's a key thing that I'd like to see improvement in. I like the things that we're doing in character development and I'd like to see that continue. I know just this year the 2 by 2 program uh, for character development uh, was brought in I believe to all the schools and this is a good model to bring in for uh, showing students uh, aspects of character that they could acquire. and. Uh, they obviously, this is one of our goals as educators also to make sure that we develop good citizens, good patriotic citizens. This is very important. Thank you. The next question, as budgets become tighter, districts are forced to make difficult decisions. Some communities feel that subjects such as art, music, and sports can be expendable. Do you agree? And we begin with Mr. Byteen. Well, no, absolutely not. Um, I think it's been a theme here tonight that <clears throat> many of us recognize the value um, that there's a, there's a term that's used very frequently in referring to things that are not core um, teachings. It's, it's extracurricular. I'm going to channel my good friend uh, Walt Pregler here and say we should remove that term from our vocabulary. It, the, everything we do is co-curricular. It's all designed to build um, students with uh, good and solid experiences, not only academic experiences, but working with groups, collaborating, so on and so forth. So um, I, I think it's real important that we have these opportunities that are multifaceted that allow students to be successful. Uh, and that's pretty much what I said. Ms. Siegert? Um, I am definitely against cutting any subject 
from the curriculum. Um, for some kids, like that one class and that day, music, art, even PE, that's the one thing that they look forward to all day. Like, if you were to cut that, how are you going to keep a high school kid in school if you can't even give them the one thing they look forward to? So no, I'm definitely, definitely against that. Mr. Procasco. Yes, I concur with the, with the, with the other people. Uh, I think activities are a very, very valuable part of education. Um, I myself have been an athletic high school athletic official for close to 50 years and uh, I see the value of sports. This is only one of the activities I'm going to speak to as far as character development, self-confidence, uh, leadership, things of this nature. Some, sometimes you learn that everybody doesn't win all the time. You're not going to win every day. As far as uh, a lot of the arts and drama, there have been a lot of people that I have known uh, there were uh, drama students in high school participating in these activities. They went on to careers in drama. If not anything else, later on in life, they enriched their own lives by participating, like in the Barn Community Theater, uh, our local uh, theatrical productions, etc. And so obviously we need to keep some of these activities. Just This is part of their overall character development. And uh, I'm in favor of really not making any cuts there. Davis. Yes, thank you. I, and I guess I'd just like to step back on the last question and add a couple things. Um, the district communication, great improvements with Mike size and the communication we have with parents, staff, it's been absolutely tremendous. Uh, freeing the, our teachers from the administrative burdens to help them unleash and focus on the teacher-student relationship is something we need to work on. Parental engagement, I 100% agree um, that that's an important thing too. Uh, you know, Tara just mentioned something that really hits it right on the point. I'm mean, right on the head. I mean, I, I know kids. They, they, they go to school. One thing's keeping them in school. It's a relationship with somebody in an activity. It's the band. It's the art class. It's, it's working on the school newspaper. I mean, when we, can, when we help our kids find their passion, when they find that passion, everything changes. And it's not just the athletic activity or the band or the art room, it's everything. It's the reason why they continue to want to really be engaged in school. And when you look at the core, or the Iowa core, uh, developing leaders, hard work, relationships, uh, solving problems, um, possessing confidence, all of those things where we get the biggest bang for the buck, small cost, big results, is in the activity problems programs and I think that is something that many on the current board feel very passionate about is how do we make those activity programs some of the best in the area. And perhaps there's a little relationship with the last question. This one reads, many of you support character education. If that would be added to the school day, what would be removed? Um, Ms. Seeger, could we begin with you? Sure. Um, I don't think anything would have to be removed if that was added to the curriculum. Um, it's already true that uh, schools have um, assemblies where they learn a little bit about character development or they have a guest speaker. And I think um, if you were to do that once a week or once a month or whenever it would be needed, I think would be a great um, asset to the curriculum. I think character development is very important but I don't think removing anything would be necessary. Thank you. Mr. Perkaska. I agree. Um, I know particularly in the elementary level, uh, many of the teachers think that uh, there are a lot of things thrown onto their plate. And this would not be a thing that I think should formally be thrown onto their plate. However, it's something that uh, the in-services could continually remind our teachers that this is one of our major uh, parts of our strategic plan. And many times just modeling, uh, teaching uh, respect, uh, patriotism, uh, respecting each other, respecting yourself. Some of these things can be modeled by the classroom teacher. And I don't think it has to be a formal, uh, let's say a formal course, as we would call it. Thanks. And Mr. Davis? 
the Dubuque community is, is fortunate to have some resources in this area. The two by two program that Kristen Woodward founded and we have many community members involved in that is one of the leaders in the country in helping to infuse character into traditional classroom lesson activities, whether they be math or reading or whatever the subject may be. And that that character building component is added right into the traditional coursework. And uh, we have have schools that have been piling that for a number of years and there's many of us that feel very strongly that that's a tremendous program. It's a, been recognized across the country as a tremendous program. We also have some individual pockets of buildings that have their own homegrown uh, character programs in the building and I guess the one that is uh, I'll never forget being in the uh, in the um, Kennedy Elementary School building and the, the whole staff the principals the kids you listen to the announcements in the morning it's all about character and they'd have a tremendous program that could be modeled in any school in the country um, so I think we have some resources I think we've been a little slow in getting that moved forward but we're getting there and I don't haven't heard anybody on our board or these candidates that are opposed to that that we all believe in that and we're all looking forward to that really moving forward um, <clears throat> character is is not a discipline it's not a course um, it's it's in the relationships that exist between a, a teacher and the student and student to student peer to peer and of course parents to students. And it's something that can be modeled, I think Jim is correct. I think it's something that can be somewhat programmatic in programs like two plus two, or two by two. Um, but it really comes down to how we treat one another and how we choose to communicate with one another out of respect and out of mutual admiration. And if that, that can be done, I think probably most effectively through professional development uh, with teachers to show them here are ways that you can infuse this into the lesson plan as opposed to saying well here's another book that you have to have them read it really has to be a thematic infusion not not simply a piece of the curriculum it has to be you know it has to really uh, uh, you know infect everything so it's it's an attitude uh, it's relationships um, very very important um, and it's something the board I know has felt very very strongly about that it can't just be something we say it's got to be something that we do every day. As the gap increases between the haves and the have-nots in our country and in our local schools, how would you even out socioeconomic status in the elementary populations? <laughs> Mr. Prokaska, any thoughts? <laughs> mm, that's a very difficult question. Very difficult. I, I whoever uh, had that question in mind, we're probably thinking of some ways of moving student population back and forth, things of that nature. And I don't think that's very practical. Uh, some type of busing realignment or busing situation. Um, I guess, uh, our, you know, our schools are no, our schools are kind of a reflection of society. And uh, they're kind of no better or no worse than the uh, society of uh, families that send their students there. And so I think that, you know, some schools obviously are in more need of assistance they require more teacher corroboration, uh, more uh, s sympathy, more time devoted to individual students than other schools. So, I don't, but I don't think overall that the practicality of evening that all out would uh, really work out very well. Thank you. Mr. Davis. I think we're fortunate in Dubuque that there's in my perspective, there's less of a gap between the haves and the have-nots. I think Dubuque is a, generally a pretty middle-class place, and I think there are certainly places across the country that struggle with these issues much more than Dubuque does. Um, I was asked a, this type of question by the Telegraph Herald editorial board, 
And really there, there are two solutions that, that I see. One is we bus people all over town to get that demographic um, to work, or two is our, we have a dip, we have our neighborhoods start to change a little bit as far as what the makeup of our neighborhoods is so that our neighborhoods are more equal across the community. Now I don't, as far as busing elementary kids, that's not a very popular thing. Um, we do have very balanced demographics in our high schools. I think there's some things we could do down to our middle schools since we have so few of them, but I think part of this question hopefully will answer itself in what the community has done to help many of our neighborhoods uh, on the uh, river side of our community to to be stronger the B branch project the Washington neighborhood projects as those projects take hold I guess it's it's the hope that they become less of a that there becomes more economic diversity in those communities than what there is and that will then affect the makeup of the uh, of those schools, so it is a difficult question and um, uh, not doesn't lend itself to an easy answer. And hopefully, the things we're doing as a community on a community-wide basis will help uh, even some of those things out. Mr. Bateen, there's no doubt that we have um, perceived inequities um, within our community. We have uh, population downtown uh, in our schools that, in some cases, is 80 percent free and reduced lunch. Out west, it's only 10 percent. Um, and that's just the way it is. And, and there are communities that struggle more with this than perhaps we do. Uh, nevertheless, um, through Title I monies for schools that are eligible for those monies, there's additional resources for those um, uh, populations. Uh, I remember talking to Jean McDonald um, when she was still at Fulton about um, kids in the summer getting ready for summer, being excited that school was going to get out. And a, a large number of the kids were less excited because they, they had a caring adult to come every day and pay attention to them and have time for them where they may have a parent or an adult who has to work long hours and is just simply not there as often. I mean, that's a real issue uh, that we have to face. Uh, busing is not the answer. I agree with, uh, with, with most of my colleagues here. Um, I think one of the things we're doing this year, if I can just mention one thing, is that uh, we have a high level of mobility amongst uh, the kids and the population downtown. And oftentimes they'll be moving within one jurisdiction of a school to another three or four times during the year simply because they're looking for the right place to live or they're needing to change for various reasons. Uh, we've instituted a program this year, I know, that allows these kids to stay in the school they start at. So you're decreasing the amount of anxiety associated with changing schools as often as they would otherwise have to. So look, we can do some things, we can do incremental things. Uh, we can't wave a wand. It's a societal issue as well. Uh, we can just do the best that we can and hope that we can provide the services those kids need. Ms. Seeker? Um, for me, um, I kind of guess disagree with George. I think that the working class is, is dwindling. There's been a huge spread. Um, I think that a lot of working class people are struggling to stay out of the poverty level um, in the nation and in Dubuque. I mean, I obviously come from a working class family and I'm far from poverty, but add two more kids to it and we could be close. I mean, there's a lot of families out there that are struggling and um, I think we have to embrace the fact that our population evolves with time um, and uh, needs evolve as well. I think that um, obviously busing kids around is not going to help. I think. Uh, that's why people embrace the neighborhood schools. Uh, I think just that is when it comes into play that teachers and, and our paras, uh, that's where the professional development comes in. Um, extra training to help these kids that maybe do come from a poverty level. Um, busing them all around the city is not going to help. They still need the help and I think it's important that we train our teachers um, to understand the issues that are at hand there. I think we have exhausted our questions, so maybe we'll end a little early tonight. At this time, each candidate has two minutes for closing remarks. And so we'll begin with you, Ms. Seeger, if you could. Um, thank you. Thank you for inviting me, too. I appreciate it. Um, for me, a lot of people ask me why I'm running for school board. Um, I don't have a personal agenda. 
I don't find anything wrong that the board has been deciding on in the last couple years. I don't have a problem with something that's been going on. Um, it's true I am young. I have young kids. But I think that gives me a valuable perspective on the needs of children in the district and the families in the district. I also come from a working class family. Um, both of us work. Um, obviously, I don't have 40 years of teaching. I'm not even that old yet, um, but um, but that but no, but I mean, and obviously I don't have experience on the board either. I I haven't served on it yet, but I I really do look forward to being elected. I think um, there's nothing wrong with new ideas and new faces and a different perspective to be brought to the board. Um, I think I can bring a valuable perspective and maybe some new ideas um, with my education. Um, my hope is to continue to create an environment for our students so they can have in our every school in our entire district where all of our children are given the opportunity to excel at their potential. And, and that is why I'm running. Thank you. I guess I'm the uh, grandfather of <laughs> okay. That's okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, I too, uh, have, have always had an interest in education, I dedicated my whole life to education, and uh, I wish that this, this is kind of my supreme uh, giving back to uh, the education field. Uh, like I said, I've been a 40-year educator, 50 years uh, resident of the city of Dubuque. Uh, I realize the role of the school board is, uh, you know, it's, it's, I think there's three basic rule, uh, roles of the school board. Number one, hire the superintendent, he hires the professionals, let the professionals handle the situations. Uh, the board is not to micromanage uh, individual uh, uh, things within the school district. It's very important that a school board member maintain community trust. Not only trust for your safety of your children, but also trust with your finances. And I've been reasonably uh, uh, conservative in uh, the financial area. The other thing is for the school board member is to uh, make sure that the school district follows the board policies in existence if there are any new policies to make sure that they are uh, enacted properly. Um, so I, I look forward to working with the present board, the present superintendent, and uh, I think they've done a great job and uh, I enjoyed being here tonight. I want to thank the League of Women Voters and all of you for attending. I'd just like to remind you to vote on September 10th. And also, just to clarify an issue, I talked to some people, some people said, oh, I live in Asbury. Mm -hmm. uh, no, you're still in the Dubuque Community School District. So if you have any of your family that go to the Dubuque schools, make sure that you uh, vote September 10th. Thank you. Mr. Davis. Yes, Jim, from the uh, Jackson County line to the Clayton County line and halfway across Dubuque County uh, out to the truck stop, uh, you're all in the Dubuque School District. So if the bus comes by your school, says Dubuque School District, you're in the Dubuque School District. So um, I have, there's nothing I've done, I've done a lot of great things in my life, there's nothing I've done that's given me more enjoyment than trying to do my best to help the school district to help us be a great school district. I, I truly believe that when people find their passion, uh, everything changes, whether it's our kids or whether it's the employees that work for the district or whether, uh, whether it's uh, the parents or anybody. Uh, I believe that the ideas have to win, and it doesn't matter whose idea they are. Somebody came up with the idea to try these tempor temporary air conditioners. If these things really will work and get us over the hump where we don't have to shorten school or call off school and we don't have to spend $30 million or $30, $40 million to air condition many of the buildings that, the other half of the buildings that ha we haven't air conditioned yet, that's a plus. And um, getting a, to a place where we can un help unleash the teacher-student relationship, remove some of the burdens that teachers face administratively and so that they can focus their attentions on students. I think that's something that hopefully will bring us some uh, better student achievement. Um, uh, my kids have been very successful in the Dubuque School District. I love the Dubuque School District. I love our community and I guess to wrap things up I would say that I've been through the difficult financial times on the district. We have tremendous finances right now. 
nothing works unless our finances in order and of all the things that I've tried to use my talents to help the district I think that's the one that I think has made the biggest district for the district is going from the place we were with finances cash increased cash lower debt um, to help make all the programs possible and let us focus on education rather than where we're going to come up with the money to pay our teachers tomorrow. So um, thank you to League of Women Voters and thank you all for attending tonight. I want to join with my colleagues in thanking the League of Women Voters for tonight's uh, event. I appreciate all those who have attended this evening. Um, I, I think serving on the board the last four years, and I've said this to my wife many times, it's, it's been one of the most rewarding personal experiences of my life. Um, not only to work with people who care about what's going on in the district, um, but to know that decisions we make now really have a significant impact on our future, on our workforce, on the success of our kids, on the success of our families, and ultimately the success of Dubuque. Um, if I bring anything to the board, uh, other than the four years of experience, I was very fortunate enough to be uh, unanimously elected as vice president and president of the board um, in a year where we had a lot of transitions and had to manage through a, a, not only a transition in leadership, but setting a new direction for the board. And I'm, 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 I look back at that and I believe we did the right thing. I think we made the right choices. And I think that set us on a, on a framework now for the future that can be very successful for us. Um, I don't have a personal agenda, but I do have an agenda. And that is to ensure that our kids have every opportunity to be successful. What does that mean? That means more dual enrollment opportunities with NICC, different pathways for kids to be successful, moving kids into the trades where we desperately need them. Um, uh, we have, I think, uh, a very good and successful alternative high school program. Matter of fact, I think some of the models of teaching there can be brought into the more traditional environment as well in terms of contextualized learning, case-based learning. Uh, we have a special education program that is the model for the state. We have so many great things, uh, but we, have, we can lengthen our stride, we can do better. I think it will require leadership that's knowledgeable, who's willing to go the extra mile, put the time in. Uh, this is, let anybody fool you, this is, is, this is not something you do casually. It's something you have to take very seriously, and it's been my honor to do so for the last four years, and I hope that you'll support me for the next. Thank you. Thank you. And we certainly thank you candidates for your participation tonight. And we also thank the school system for providing this room and the filming of this forum and rebroadcasting of it. And to you, the audience, thank you for your interest. Remember to use your power as citizens to vote on September 10th. The next League of Women Voters candidate forum will be on September 24th if a city primary is required and October 22nd for the city election. Both of these forums will be in the city council chambers in the historic federal building. And just a word, we would uh, certainly encourage you to consider membership in the League of Women Voters. It is not for women only. And there are membership cards on the table near the entrance to this room. And we will be having our membership meeting on September 18th. That's a Wednesday evening at 6.30. It will be held at the Mandolin Inn. And our speaker will be Amy Campbell, who is uh, the league lobbyist from Des Moines. And I think you'd find her very interesting. So again, thank you for being here. And good night. <laughs>